speech and now look to Professor Norman Fost to close the case for the opposition. Here, here. Mr. President, honorable members, esteemed guests, thank you for doing me the honor of inviting me to this historic series. It's always dangerous to reduce complex moral questions to binary formats, yes or no, I or nay. I'm reminded of Louis Agassiz, the great naturalist who when taking his citizenship exam was asked, do you advocate the overthrow of the United States government by force or violence? Agassiz thought for a minute and said, by force. <laughs> The motion before us tonight is terminally unclear. It speaks of manipulation of human DNA. If there's a necessity to do that, that can be discharged by swabbing one's cheek and mailing it off to 23andMe and learning about one's genealogy. One will have then performed manipulation of DNA and discharged the necessary moral duty. I don't think that's what the organizers had in mind. I think they had in mind something more serious that's not clear from the motion, such as genetic manipulation of human embryos. I'm going to focus my remarks as if that is the topic, although I don't think the proponents will be pleased about that because one of them said on the record years ago, quote, any manipulation of human embryos should be prohibited, end quote. But nonetheless, I will address that issue. The great American philosopher Judith Jarvis Thompson in her iconic essay in defense of abortion began her argument by conceding her opponent's strongest argument, namely recognizing the personhood of the fetus. And Professor Thompson said, even if the fetus is a person in the same sense that all of us are, it doesn't follow that it's impermissible to kill it and went on to show why it might be quite permissible under certain circumstances to kill it, even if it were a person. I'm no Judith Thompson, but I would like to use her tactic and concede the strongest argument of the proponents, namely that research on the human embryo, genetic research on the human embryo has enormous potential for relieving human suffering and improving the quality of human lives, innumerable lives in future generations. Let's stipulate that. What doesn't follow from that is that there is a necessity to do it. It only says that it is a good thing to do, a permissible thing to do, and that it should not be banned. But there is no argument, there's no implication that it is necessary to do it. It's fine for me to go for a walk in Hyde Park. It's desirable that I do it. It should not be banned. There should, should not be opposed, but it doesn't follow that there's a necessity for me to do it. We need to remember Immanuel Kant's famous distinction between perfect human obligations, perfect duties, and imperfect duties. Kant spoke of certain prima facie duties that are duties for all of us. Tell the truth, keep promises, don't injure people, and make reparations when you do cause harm to others. These are perfect human obligations because they, attain to, they apply to all of us and we all can discharge them on a daily basis. In contrast with imperfect human duties, things that are desirable but supererogatory above and beyond the call of duty, like helping others, improving the lot of humankind. Those are good things, but they're not necessities. They're not requirements because they, have, they are infinitely elastic. All of us right now is failing to help untold millions of people around the world. It doesn't make us immoral because there is no clear duty to help all of those people. It's unclear which, if any of them, are owed our help. We probably have a duty to help someone and most of us are probably doing that. But to say we have a duty to help everyone is an imperfect duty because it is so ill-defined. Similarly, not harming, as has been pointed out, is a perfect moral duty, but failing to help is not. Contrary to what one of the proponents said, killing is not the same as letting die. Doctors let patients die every day. Doctors generally do not kill. 
And if you were to walk into a society and start acting as if killing were the same as letting die, you would find yourself in prison very quickly in almost every country in the world. So this distinction between absolute duties, such as not causing harm, versus imperfect duties, such as failing to help, is important. If there is a necessity, and we haven't heard what the argument is, but if there's a necessity to perform genetic research on human embryos, not a desirability, but a necessity, the proponents need to tell us who has this duty. If there's a duty to do it, someone must have this duty. It's certainly not everyone. As we have heard, we wouldn't want the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker to be performing this kind of research. Well, maybe it's just scientists. Which ones? All of them? If it's a necessity, then all the scientists in the world should drop what they're doing and flock to this technology. Well, maybe it's just the ones doing embryo research. But really, if we just impose this necessity on them, which diseases should they be working on? Which should they be working on disease or on improving human traits, on enhancement? Without filling in the missing words, we don't know what it means to say that there's a necessity for someone, unspecified, to do this kind of research. It was, I almost was about to raise a point of order when the proponents had finished their speeches and not one had yet addressed this issue of necessity. They told us about how desirable this technology is, about all the help that it would cause, that it would bring, uh, but not about necessity. And in fact, while I have stipulated the benefits of this technology, let's acknowledge that it is oversold, that understanding human genetics will not necessarily lead to cures or prevention. We have known the basic molecular defect in sickle cell disease for 70 years, and we're not one day closer to any kind of definitive treatment for that disease. This overselling of genetics has been true since the double helix was first identified. I'm reminded of the woman who got married for the fourth time and said to her husband on her wedding night, please be gentle, this is my first time. And her husband said, what is that about? You've had three husbands. And she said, well, the first one was very rich and very old, and I married him for the money, and I lucked out, he dropped dead right after the ceremony, right there in the chapel, and I inherited a million dollars, but the marriage was never consummated. And he said, well, what about the second one? She said, well, he was young and handsome, but it turned out he was impotent and a mess, and the marriage was annulled and it was never consummated. And he said, well, what about the third one? And she said, well, he was a geneticist, and all he used to do was sit at the end of the bed and talk about how great things are going to be. <laughs> The proponents are fearful about ethicists who raise these concerns about the hazards of necessity and the vagueness of necessity. They would probably agree with the wag who said, if all the ethicists in the world were laid end to end, it would be a good thing. <laughs> but the fact is that they have not yet made the case for necessity. It is very telling that the last speaker used this as example of the wonders of technology, PKU, the oldest and first disease which was conquered by newborn screening. What he didn't tell you is that for the first 13 years, a very zealous, passionate group of people who imposed this on the American people without the intervention of controlled trials, informed consent, oversight by IRBs, that for those first 13 years, the test for PKU had a 95% false positive rate and the dose of the diet was poorly understood so that many normal children were harmed by it, many normal children were made retarded by this program, and several died, one of kwashiorkor from protein malnutrition. It took 13 years to figure all that out. Eventually, there was a benefit, but the passion and the zeal that lies behind this notion of necessity, we must do this and we must do it now, the urgency of now, as President Obama said, in that case led, and in many others, to significant harm. No one on the opposition is against this technology. No one has argued that we should not do research on the human embryo and try to improve the lot of humankind. No one has argued for a ban. 
what we are against is an ill-defined claim of necessity until our proponents tell us what that word means, which they have failed to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.